whenever I have a networking question, I always Google. I go to Google first and be like, all right, how does OSPF prevent loops in its, in its design? And I'm like, all right, Google it. There weren't too much stuff about it. Then I went to YouTube and was like, let me see if there's a video out there. So I put OSPF loop prevention. Guess how many hits I got? I got zero hits on OSPF loop prevention. I had all of these videos on loop preventions, like I, I layer two, like spanning tree. And I was like, yeah, I already know about spanning tree. It's all good. But how does OSPF prevent inter area loops? So I decided I'm going to do the research. I'm going to make a lab and I'm going to do a video. So here it is. I'm your host, CCMP Seth. So let's get into OSPF inter area loop prevention. So some key terms in OSPF loop prevention. Uh, I'm going to go over some, some key terms. And first thing is, area zero is used to exchange inter area routes. So what that means is, all the routes that are in area two has to flow through area zero to get to area one. Uh, area zero is the backbone. And uh, these routes that are coming from area two they are LSA type 1s, and then as they go through the area border router, they are turned into LSA type 3s, and then it gets pushed into area 1, and these are still uh, LSA type 3s. So, uh, what is an area border router? Well, it is a router that has at least one interface in area 0, and another interface in another area. So, based on our topology that we have here, we have two routers, possibly three, that uh, is a area border router. So we have this interface right here is in area zero, and this interface on R1 is in area one, so that meets the criteria. So this router right here is an area border router for OSPF. Same thing with router four. That interface is in area zero, these interfaces are in area two, bam, ABR. Uh, R3, he's a special case right here. He does have an area or an interface in area one, and he does have interfaces in area two, but based on the definition of what an area border router is, he doesn't have a physical interface in area zero, so he should not be considered an ABR. All right, uh, another key term about area border routers is that they expect summary LSAs from area zero only. So if R3 sends a type three LSA to R1, R1's like, whoa, 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 you're sending me that type three LSA on, on my area one interface. I should, ex I should be expecting it from area zero. Um, that's fishy. And I'll get into uh, why it's fishy and how LSPF blocks that stuff. So uh, let's see, only expects type 3 LSAs from area 0 and that interface, this interface right here, should have a full adjacency with area 0 and it does. So uh, it will ignore all other type 3 LSAs from the non-backbone areas. Alright, so this is all definition and I'll get into uh, configurations in, in just a sec. Also, ABRs will accept and use type 3 LSAs learned from non-backbone areas if it does not have a full adjacency with area 0. Alright, so what is that saying? That is saying, if this guy right here, R3, let me clear this off, does not have a full adjacency with this backbone area, then uh, then we can create an interface and put it in area zero in area zero and it won't have a full adjacency it will have like a partial adjacency so he's like well that's good enough and I'll be able to pass routes back and forth alright so uh, let's get into some questions that I have built so here are some what-if questions first thing is R3 considered an ABR just the way it sits right here no extra interface is created. Let's see. So let's go into router 2 and bring this up. And what is my command here? Show IP OSPF border routers. Uh, show IP OSPF border routers. And nope. As it sits, 
1111 out of fast ethernet F00 is this guy right here. So like we said before, he is an ABR. That's good. Ugh. Yep, that's an ABR. And uh, the goal is router 2 wants to send traffic to router 5 but doesn't want to take this whole entire route. It has to go through router 1, through router 6, R4, and then all the way to router 5 to get to there. And if we go to uh, its routing table, show IP route, include 5.5.5.5, we see that it has a cost of 5 and it's going out fast than at 0, 0. So these are all fast Ethernet links, so this is cost of 1, 2, 3, 4, and then the loopback address is 5. So that is suboptimal routing. We want to take the shortest route to go through R3. So how do we do that? Well, for R3 to say, hey, I could send routes from area 2 to area 1 and back and forth, uh, and you could use me as an ABR, we have to give him an interface in area zero. So how do we do that? Uh, it's actually quite simple. Let's go into router three. And let's do show IP interface brief, uh, exclude unassigned addresses. So here we have some loopbacks I, I have already created on uh, router three. And let's see which of these loopbacks are in which areas. So let's do show run section router OSPF. And we have one loopback in area two, another loopback in area three, but we don't have this 30 loopback or this uh, loopback zero uh, in any area. So let's put that interface in area zero. Um, before I do that, right, nope, we're good, yep, so router OSPF, uh, was it, one, and let's do network 30.30.30.30.0, area zero, bam. All right, now that I put an interface in area zero, first of all, it's not connecting to anything. It's a loopback address, so it doesn't have a full adjacency. So let's see now if router two believes router three is an ABR. Look at that, he does. The router ID for router three is 33, 33, 33. So let's do this show IP route thing. Look at that the actual uh, metric went down. Notice it was five and now it went to three and its next hop is 23.3 .3, and that's out fast Ethernet at zero slash one which means it is now taking this uh, better route than what it used to. All right so now that uh, routes are going this way and routes are going that way what is stopping routes from going R1 and R1's like, oh, you want to get to uh, uh, the loopback of R5? Well, I'm just going to inject it here, tell R6 about it so he has a better path. Um, no, that will not work because that would just be a loop because then he would pass it this way and it would just go round and round and round and round and round. That doesn't work. So since R1 and R4 have a full adjacency with R6, which is an area zero, it will not use routes learned via R3 because R3 doesn't have a full adjacency with area zero. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, let's do some show commands. So let's go into R1 and let's do some show commands so we see which route R1 is taking. So let's start with show IP route, include the network of 5.5.5.5, and bam, look at that. It's uh, outgoing interface is faster than 0.1 and it has a cost of 4. So let's look at our topology. Fa uh, outgoing interface faster than 0.1 so it's going this way and it has a cost of 4 so these are all uh, fast Ethernet links so 
uh, its cost to its actual loopback address is uh, a cost of four. And if we went through R3, it would be actually a cost of, whoops, not three. Ah. That would be a cost of two. And then the final cost would be um, three instead of four because it's, uh, it's a quicker hop. So that's good. So how do we know that actually it's uh, learning about these routes via R3? Well, we have to go into the LSDB of router one and uh, let's, uh, let's do this. Show IP OSPF uh, database. Sure, we could do that. Let's see here. Uh, look at that right there. It learned about it through um, area one. So router one is telling himself about it. Uh, router three is telling him about it. And if actually we scroll up, we also learning it from uh, router four, which is this guy right here because he actually advertised it. So it flows through R6 and um, yeah, so this proves that R1 will actually uh, trust area zero routes or at least routes flowing through area zero versus a router that doesn't have a full adjacency with it. And if we go dig a little deeper, we can do summary 5.5.5.5 and it'll actually give us the cost. So router four says, hey, it cost me two to get to him. Um, but how long or uh, how much does it cost R1 to get to R4? That's a cost of two. And R3 is advertising, that's R3, a metric of two as well, but it costs R1 one to go to him. So that proves that it doesn't, uh, it won't use those routes. So yeah, that's it. But, uh, how do you know if it's not being passed to R6? Well, one, I just told you, and two, if you don't trust me, we gotta double check it. You know, CCMP, I don't trust you, just because you said it doesn't mean it's true. Well, yeah, if you always believe uh, things people say, uh, that will, that's bad. Don't believe everything that people say, because a lot of times people are wrong. But CCMP Seth is talking, and He's right. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not always right. But uh, I will prove to you that it's not being advertised to R, uh, to, to R6. So let's go into R6 and see how many different ways it learned about R5. So on this theory of, of uh, routes being blocked here, it should only learn about 5.5.5.5 uh, .5 via this way. That's my theory. So let's uh, let's prove this here. Let's try to prove myself wrong. I like how that stays there. That's funny. All right. Uh, show IP OSPF uh, database summary 5.5.5.5. And I'm guessing I'm only going to learn it once. Bam, look at that. So that just proved that router one is not advertising routes to uh, router six. Sweet. Let's clear that off. Uh, what else we got here? So R1 still prefers R6 to get to R5. Uh, yep, yeah, that is true. So now that it is receiving those routes in two different ways, let's go back. And it's still preferring fast ethernet zero slash one, uh, which is this way right here. So um, R3 told him he can go through me, but it's not using it. So what if I want R1 to go through R3 to go to R5? Um, let's see here. R1 will prefer R6 because of its full adjacency. So how do we have it prefer R3? Well, let's give it a full adjacency and uh, have R1 go through R5. But CCMP says, how do we do that? Um, 
Well, there's this thing called virtual links. I don't know if you guys have ever studied that before, but all we have to do is just connect R3, give a virtual link to R1, and then R1 will trust uh, router 3 and be like, all right, you have a full adjacency with area 0. You are telling me you have a better route for me for R5, so I will use you. But first, we need to do this virtual link. So let's configure that. Go into router 1. Fig T. Router. Router. OSPF 1. Area. Oh, not area 1. Enter. Area 1. Virtual link. And then the uh, router ID of that neighbor. So what was he? 33, 33, 3. We should probably lose our adjacency once the hold down timer goes away. But let's go into R3 and let's do that same command. Area 1 virtual link 1.1.1.1. Bam. What's going to happen here? We got a new adjacency. Sweet. Now let's go into the routing table of R1. And I'm hoping, having my fingers crossed, that it is going to prefer. Uh, the outgoing interface of fast Ethernet 1 slash 0 and it will point th through R3 and it'll have a cost of 3 versus 4 out that interface. Making a lot of bold predictions today. Let's see if I'm right. Where am I at? R1? Let's hit enter. Bam! Look at that. Right there. 3 fast Ethernet 1 slash 0 and is that what I had? Bam! Look at that. So, yeah, that's it. So, that is what I wanted to show you. How OSPF prevents loops. Uh, it all has to do with the area border router and if it has full adjacencies with this guy. And if you want to put a router in between two areas and you want routes to go back and forth, create a loopback uh, address of R3 and put him in area 0. He'll have a partial connection to area 0, which will put him in ABR status. So areas one and uh, area 1 and 2 can send routes to each other, and this guy can take the most optimal path. So uh, that was a lot. Usually I don't make my videos this long, but I was so interested in this on how uh, OSPF prevented loops, and I was doing all this research, and there's so much going on that I just had to put it in a video. Um, I hope this was informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.